And that next day, I uh, came into prison, uh, 24 years old, young, uh, not knowing nothing about the prison lifestyle, light-skinned uh, from a Mexican gang. And uh, two weeks into to prison, it's called reception. So two weeks into reception, a uh, riot breaks out, and I get stabbed uh, next to my artery by my groin. And I end up uh, stabbing the guy back in the neck that uh, assaulted me. Within my first two weeks of reception, just walking into prison, I end up in a prison within a prison where mostly all the bad people are at. And this is really where my life really took a turn. So my name is Jason Lopez. I'm 43 years old. I grew up in Alhambra, California. I'm the youngest of two brothers, and I have two older stepbrothers. Um, I'm married. Um, I have a daughter. And this is my story. I grew up with a mom and a dad. They were divorced when I was one years old. Um, right away, my mom remarried. Uh, well, she actually, uh, a man moved in named Mike, and he ended up raising me till I was 17, and they got married. So uh, at a young age, he, he really took me in, took a liking to me. As I was young, I, I used to like riding BMX bikes, skateboarding. Uh, my stepdad, he got me into golf, which I know that it's not too popular, but I liked it. I played baseball. My mom was uh, my baseball coach, you know, a team mom. Um, I had a really good upbringing, you know, I had a good family. Uh, can't really complain too much. I mean, we weren't rich, but we weren't poor. I kind of struggled uh, in education, kind of made up a lot of stories. Uh, I think I had uh, insecurity issues, maybe because I was thin, I was tall, uh, my light skin, and I come from a Mexican family, and uh, I kind of stood out. I would make up stories to, to impress myself, to impress my friends, and, and I seen as I was growing up, uh, those lies and those stories, they became worse and worse, and I had to tell another lie to tell another lie. And um, I just started uh, getting in trouble. Uh, my teachers would always call my house. My mom, she used to work for San Gabriel High School. She used to be a special ed teacher, and special ed was for the troubled kids, uh, kids that were gang members and, and abused uh, uh, teenagers, the girls that got uh, pregnant real real young in life, so my mom was really hip to what was going on on the streets, you know? And so she kind of seen I was following that direction at a young age. So she was being real strict with me, and I really didn't like that. She was kind of too strict. On the weekends, as I was about 10 years old, 11, I started going to my dad's house. And my stepmom's family was more of a, a vario kind of family, a, a family that was partying in the hood, and, and, and uh, I took a liking to that. And so every other weekend, I would go to my dad's and I would look forward to it because it was a different atmosphere than with my mom. My mom's side of the family was kind of kind of clean cut, kind of uh, uh, formal. My dad and my stepmom's family, there was kind of like no barriers there, just craziness and nonsense, and I really liked that. As I started hanging around with my step family and, and going to family functions, I seen that they were partying, they were playing the, the, the disco music and oldies music, and there was beer, and there was a little bit of weed, and. And uh, the cocaine, I really didn't see it, but it started coming real, real quick. And as I started getting a little bit older, about 12, 13, 14 years old, I started telling my mom, man, I can't take this no more living with you. This is, this is too much. You're, you're, too, you're, you're, you're sheltering me too much. So I started talking to my dad to see if I could move in with my dad, and, and I did. And so from eighth grade, the end of eighth grade, I moved to Rowan Heights, which is a city in the San Gabriel Valley next to La Puente. My stepbrothers were living there. Uh, they were kind of into the cholo scene, disco scene, and my, one of my stepbrothers, he hung out with a, with a gang, and, and they were selling drugs and getting high all the time, and I really, really liked it. And so I started hanging out with my stepbrother, and I got into selling drugs at a young age. I started to test the drugs, and once I tested that drug, my life was never the same. I started off, you know, smoking weed, but when I started uh, high school, ninth grade, at 14 years old, uh, I started uh, doing speed. The speed just turned into crack cocaine, Crack cocaine just took me to places that I, I never, I never thought possible. I always wanted to try to prove myself. You know, like I told you, I, I grew up, I was very insecure, so I always wanted to make myself seem like I was stronger than I really was. But inside, I was, I was hurting. Uh, I was hurting because I, I didn't want people to really see what I, what was going on inside of my mind. You know, and I just kept feeding myself with, with the drugs. You know, I kept feeding myself with the methamphetamines. And at 15, I'm already hooked on, on methamphetamine. And people don't really know that I'm doing crack cocaine. It was kind of, it was kind of a, a secret. And um, 
I was trying to hide it real well, but my dad, he would, he would see it. And I was hanging out with, with people I never thought I would ever hang out with. And I'm in high school and I got kicked out already in my, my junior year for possession of, of narcotics, you know? And so my mom, my stepmom, and my dad, they were at work all day, so I would just sell drugs out of the house all day long. Like, it was just, I thought it was cool, you know? I had traffic over the house. Little did I know that, uh, that I was just destroying myself even more. I was going to my mom's house like I was doing every other weekend to visit. And I went to my friend's house that lived right down the street from me and he wasn't home. So I went to the 7-Eleven. And as I'm, at, I'm, as I'm at the 7-Eleven, I see some friends of mine. So I'm talking to them at the phone booth. And I noticed these guys that, that were cholos, they were coming up the street. And so we were talking and, and they needed a quarter to use the phone. And uh, no one handled it at the time. So we seen an Asian guy walking in, you know, just some, some regular looking Asian guy just going to probably go play the video games. And so one of these guys makes a remark to him, like, hey, you know, it's, it's a bad word. I don't want to say it, uh, you know, hey, you have a quarter and the guy didn't say nothing. And so we're minding our own business and 20 minutes later goes by and this car just drives up out of nowhere, right? We're not paying attention. And these guys just come out shooting and everybody's running and, and I end up getting, tripping and falling. And, I'm getting stabbed by all these Asian guys. I find out that they're from an Asian gang and we disrespected, I guess, one of their younger brothers. And after that happened, you know, my, my life kind of shifted in a different aspect in the sense that I became very racist against Asians, you know. And my friends had heard about what happened to me and we kind of started up a, a little neighborhood gang a, a, in that time. And, uh, and my, my life just started just getting worse. You know, I was living from motel to motel, hotel to hotel, it was very promiscuous. Um, just, just causing havoc, doing things that, that I should have never been doing. Uh, me and my buddy, we, we ended up in a situation with a guy I was selling drugs to, and, and his car, this guy's car, he ended, it ended up getting taken. We ended up getting arrested that night, and the detective that picked up my case, he was a partner of a sheriff that was uh, assaulted years before. And uh, this sheriff wanted to uh, I think wanted to put me away for the rest of my life because of what happened years before. And, um, and so as I'm in court, as I'm in court fighting my case, which is about six life sentences, I hear my, my I'm in the visiting room, I'm, I'm with the attorney and my dad, he's, he's banging against the glass, son, you better take this deal. And as I'm telling you this story, it, it's not even the same compared to in that moment. Because in that moment, I have the chills and, and, and tears are going down my face. And, and my dad, he's just broken. And, and I could just see the, the redness in his eyes and, and he's making a fist and he's pounding against the glass and, and you better take the deal, you better tell him what happened. And I just couldn't uh, do certain things that he wanted me to do. I had to keep my mouth shut. That's, that's just part of how I grew up and part of you know, the code on the streets. You just keep your mouth shut. And so here I'm stuck with, with two, two, uh, two roads. One is going to trial and, and looking at six or who, who knows how many life sentences or taking a deal that they offered me for 17 years for something I never did that day, but I was guilty of things in the past. And I'm making this decision and, and, and at this moment, I'm just so angry. And in this moment of time that I'm in court, I'm living in the county jail and I'm there for four months. And it is the worst four months of my whole life because I am so angry. I'm so angry of how I left a, a nice life for a little while and I went back to what I was doing to make some fast money. And here I am in a county jail and I'm doing things to people that are just unimaginable, uh, just unbelievable, uh, horrific. As I'm going back to court, I'm just angry. I'm angry at this guy who, who's testifying about me, who's making up this story about me. All I could do is, 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 is take it. I was so scared, but I couldn't show that fear. I, I had to show my anger, I had to show I was a tough guy. So at the end of the day, I ended up taking a deal. I took a deal for 17 years. Uh, out of those 17 years, I was supposed to do 14. If I didn't get any trouble, if I got in trouble, my max I would have did was 17 years. So as I left court that day, I left court a monster, just not caring about nothing. It's a, it's a real horror story. And the, the gruesomeness that, that took place in that time it's unspeakable, to be honest, and, and to even share with, with, with all of you, it's a painful thing to, to have to reflect on. I still had a, a, a few months to sit in the county jail, 
and like I was saying it, my my time there it was just it was just dark, it was just evil, and uh, my time came in October 27, 2003, 24 years old, young, uh, not knowing nothing about the prison lifestyle, light skinned, uh, from a Mexican gang. Two weeks into to prison, it's called reception. So two weeks into reception, a riot breaks out and I get stabbed uh, next to my artery by my groin. And I end up uh, stabbing the guy back in the neck that uh, assaulted me. And so within my first two weeks of reception, just walking to prison, I end up in a prison within a prison where mostly all the bad people are at. I, I continued with my wickedness, with my darkness. and. And, and I continued to be a part of the Mexican movement in there from Southern California. Things just transpired, you know, the riots, the, the, the killings. As I left that prison within a prison, which is considered the, the whole, it's a solitary confinement, I went back to the, to the main line, that's what they call it. And I just continued to do my thing, you know, just like everybody else, participated in, in the riots, participated in any activity that, that came my way. 2005, uh, things really took a turn. Uh, a situation occurred. It's a, a violent act that I, I took part in, and that sent me within that prison, within a prison again. And as I went in that area, uh, which is called the hole, as I stayed there, um, the first night I noticed this guy. He, he was talking on the vent, and he, he was he was kind of like praying. And, and then the second day, the, the same thing. And as we're in there, we're introducing ourselves through these little lines you shoot under the door and, and you communicate that way. About two weeks, this guy, he took a liking to me uh, due to he seen that I was getting visits, you know, and it didn't seem that I really belonged back there with those guys. Um, some real bad guys, like some real tough guys. And uh, it really made me start to think that uh, maybe I wasn't as bad as I used to think I was, you know. Uh, a lot of these guys had no uh, remorse. They had no care, no heart. Uh, cold-blooded and uh, I had a heart I just portrayed I didn't you know and uh, this man he started talking about me about the Lord and and, uh, and one day uh, uh, the guy next door he, he shot his line over to me and he, and he, and he told me that uh, never to disrespect this guy that's talking to me because he's somebody important in prison uh, part of the Mexican movement and so I said wow I was thinking to myself how is it that this guy is uh, about this kind of stuff but he's telling me about the Lord you know and so every day he started uh, teaching me about the Bible, you know, and, uh, and uh, I was, at first I was kind of leery about it, and he started just speaking more, you know, uh, telling me you know, about my life, and he started sharing with, sharing with me about forgiveness, you know, uh, redemption, changing your, your mind, a renewing of your mind. And at that moment, I didn't know how to explain these things as I do now, and he was telling me about transformation, repentance, conviction. Uh, he was telling me about walking in the newness of God. And at that moment, I'm thinking like, man, what is going on? Why does this guy keep telling me about this? This is going on week after week, day after day. And we, we, we used to play chess, we used to talk, you know, and, and, and amongst that conversation, you could just feel the evilness around me because that's what it was. It was a, it was a, it was a prison within a prison of, of straight darkness. So as time went by, this man, he started to, what I would say, impart to me about the Lord. And he started teaching me uh, about the Word. And he taught me how to pray, you know, and, and he started praying on the van. He started praying for all these different things, crazy things, murder, uh, abuse, uh, rape, you know, his wife, his kids. He started praying for me. And he started asking me about my personal life. And he, one day he asked me, uh, do you want to accept God? And I was like, wow. How could, you, how could you ask me that back here in the back, man? Like, people, what are people gonna think about me, you know? 